بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته قرآن ويكلي إن شاء الله today's uh, video is about a very important uh, topic and that is racism uh, how does Islam view racism what does Islam have to tell us about racism and how to actually approach the problem of racism I think it goes without saying that it's common sense um, that any teaching or any religion or any way of life would not uh, advocate something as heinous and as terrible as racism and any you know worthwhile teaching or system of moral or ethics would oppose something as nefarious as racism and you know not too long ago uh, even here uh, for those who are at least viewing this video within the United States you know, of course, racism is a very ugly part of the history of even this country and this nation. Um, and it's something that's been witnessed all over the world at some point or another, and maybe even continues to happen even till today in certain parts of the world. But here in the United States, not too long ago in the Trayvon Martin case, we even got to uh, see a lot of racism come to the surface and a lot of people um, speaking up. Uh, and sharing their thoughts and their feelings and their sentiments about people of other ethnicities or other race or other colors. And it was uh, very unfortunate and it kind of, um, it shakes you up a little bit and makes you realize that there's still a lot of learning and growing that we still have to do in this regard. So what does the Quran, what does the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what does Islam tell us about racism? And how does Islam speak about or approach the topic of racism? I'll begin with the Book of Allah uh, by reciting a couple of ayats of the Quran. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran says, إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَأَنَّ رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that most definitely this ummah, this nation of yours is one nation. So a couple of very interesting points in the ayah. Allah says, inna with emphasis, hadihi ummatukum, that this nation of yours. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually, this is called idafa in the Arabic language where Allah gives, attributes the nation and the people and gives ownership of the people and the nation to us. It says that this is your nation, these are your people. Ummatan wahida, but they are one people, unified together. وَأَنَّ رَبُّكُمْ فَعْبُدُونَ And Allah says what unifies you above everything else, the fact that I am your Lord, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Lord, فَعْبُدُونَ And then He calls on us to worship Him, enslave ourselves to Him, devote and dedicate ourselves to Him. Now, this is a very, very basic fundamental ayah, but it talks about how the Muslim Ummah needs to realize a sense of unity among one another, amongst each other and with one another. But at the same time, even kind of opening up the topic from there, when talking about all of humanity in general, once again, there is a sense of unity there at a human level that we don't distinguish, we do not prejudice, we do not bias against one another on the basis of color, ethnicity, or language, or social status, or background. All of these things should not be a factor in how we judge, how we deal with another human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hujarat, Surah number 49, which is a very powerful fundamental surah, and it talks about many uh, very important social ethics and values. It's, it's what I've always told my students about Surah Al-Hujarat is that Surah Al-Hujarat is like a curriculum uh, on how to build a community. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hujarat, Surah number 49, in ayah number 13, Ya ayyuhan nas. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing all of humanity. And from the beauty and the coherence of Surah Al-Hujarat is that five times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan ladhina amanu, Ya ayyuhan ladhina amanu, Ya ayyuhan ladhina amanu. Time and time again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls on those people who have claimed faith, who have believed. And then finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Ya ayyuhan nas. So after talking to the Muslim community and giving them guidance and instruction, a curriculum on how to establish a community, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about all of humanity and to all of humanity and thereby telling us on how we should deal with other people in general, all people in general. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O humanity, O mankind, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarin wa untha وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ Allah says that, O mankind, O humanity, most definitely we have created all of you مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى So we have created y'all 
from one man and one woman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses all of humanity, all of mankind here, and He says, O oh humanity, O oh mankind, we have created all of y'all from one male and one female. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes a common ground that no matter who you are and where you're from and what time you live in, what era you're in, but all of you, all human beings, all of us, we all come from one man and one woman, Adam and Hawa, Adam and Eve. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلُ Allah says that we're dealing with reality here. That yes, we have made you shu'uban into different races, into different groups, waqabail, and into different tribes and families. So we split you into different ethnicities and different races, and we split you up into different tribes and different families and groups. And Allah says, What is the reason? What is the purpose? Lita arafu. That's called Lamu Ta'lil, which explains the cause or the reason for something. Allah says, We did this so that you could recognize, identify one another. This verb ta'aruf is for a mutual action so that you could recognize, you could identify one another. That there would be some type of rec you know, recognizable, identifiable you know, features or factors uh, in dealing with one another. That was the only simple reason. But the beautiful thing that Allah says here is He says li ta'arafu so you could recognize one another, so you could identify each other. It's a very positive term. Allah didn't say so that you could split up into different groups li ta'arafu so that you could split up into different factions and groups. He didn't use a negative term. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used a positive term. So that there will be very different things. I will have, a, I will know a brother named Muhammad who will be a different color than I am. I will know an Ahmad who will speak a different language than I do. And I'll know a Khalid who comes from a completely different background than I do. But Muhammad and Ahmad and Khalid and all these different brothers who are so different than me, I'm not going to hold those differences against them. That's not going to be a barrier between me and them. Rather, I'm going to appreciate the differences between us. Now, if everybody is all in all these different colors and groups and languages and tribes and families and everything is, is people are so diverse and split up. But then, you know, if that's not the criteria for knowing who's superior to another, then what is the criteria for superiority? Allah says, "Inna akramakum and Allah yatqakum," because people, you know, of course, people have a competitive edge. So, what is the criteria for superiority? That the most noble amongst you, in the eyes, in the sight of Allah, near Allah, is the one who has the most God consciousness amongst you. And the Prophet ﷺ, when explaining this verse, of course, he said, "At-taqwa ha huna, taqwa ha huna, taqwa ha huna." Taqwa is here, taqwa is here, taqwa is here, and he pointed to his heart, meaning that taqwa is in the heart. Wallahu alimun bidat sudur. And Allah is the only one who knows that which is hidden within the hearts. So, if taqwa is the criteria for superiority, and none of us can see each other's taqwa because it's in the heart, that means we don't know who's better and who's not. That means I got to treat everybody equally. I got to treat everyone with the utmost respect and regard. And I got to give everyone the type of respect that I would want, that I would ask for, that I feel like I deserve. And so I have to make sure that I extend that same courtesy to other people. In Allah Alimun Khabir, most definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly knowing of all things and constantly informed of all things. So this is the fundamental ayah that teaches us about you know, um, the evils of racism. And I wanted to supplement this a little bit from the teachings of the Prophet Wasallam, because again, what happens with a lot of people today is when you hear this, even though the Qur'an is the most practical thing that in the world, at the same time, unfortunately, because of a lack of perspective, sometimes when you explain an ayah of the Qur'an like this, people say, well, okay, that's nice in theory, but practically, come on. You're telling me it doesn't make a difference to you, no matter where somebody's from and who, they're, who, they're, who they are? So let's use some examples from the life of the Prophet ﷺ to show us, no, that's the way it's supposed to be. It shouldn't make a difference to me where somebody's from, what language they speak, what color they are. There's a very beautiful story from the life of the Prophet ﷺ about Salman al-Farsi, radiallahu anhu. Inshallah, there's another Qur'an weekly video about Salman al-Farsi and the beautiful story of him accepting Islam. So I recommend everybody, inshallah, take a look at that. But Salman al-Farsi, as his name says, Salman al-Farsi, he was Persian. And of course, the majority of the Sahaba were Arab. So he was an outsider. He was a foreigner. He was an immigrant. 
all right? And I mean, I don't condone the use of terms like this, but just to make it contextual to, to maybe some young people who are watching this, um, you know, he might have been looked at by many of the young people of that time, in that place, in that era. Of course, the Sahaba weren't like this, but maybe just the, 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 the common people in the Arab lands, when they first came across Salman, Salman to them was kind of like a fob. That's what they saw him as. He was an outsider, an older outsider, who didn't speak the language properly, who didn't really know the style and the customs and the fashion. Right? So he was easy to make fun of, because he was an outsider. So, of course, he accepts Islam, and the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of the Trench, is taking place. And in the Battle of the Trench, they had to dig a long trench uh, on one side of Medina to basically protect the city of Medina from the uh, onslaught and the oncoming armies. It's also actually called Ghaswat al-Ahzab, the, the Battle of the United Armies. And so they decided to dig a trench, and it was actually his suggestion. So even though he was the outsider, the fob, the immigrant, whatever else somebody would call a, an outsider, um, he gave the suggestion of building a trench, and the Arabs were not in the habit of building a trench. Nevertheless, nobody derided him, nobody degraded him, nobody said, get out of here with your crazy talk, and we don't even know what you're talking about, and that's not how we roll over here. Nobody said, like, nobody said anything like that to him. The Prophet ﷺ listened to him, everyone accepted his recommendation. The Prophet ﷺ, in fact, made the decision according to his suggestion, and they decided to dig the trench. Now when they were digging the trench, the Prophet ﷺ, basically for every 40 meters, he made groups of 10 Sahaba to dig the trench in that area. And he organized the groups according to families, simply because, you know, I know my brother, better than anyone else does, and my brother knows me better than anyone else does. And at the Battle of the Trench, they were hungry, they were cold, they were starving, they were suffering, they were scared. It, it was a very difficult time. And so, when, when people are under pressure, they can crack under pressure, or they can kind of, you know, um, be a little bit difficult to deal with at times under pressure. So the Prophet ﷺ put them with other people who they were familiar with, so that they would know one another. So he split up all the groups, now the issue came to Salman. What group does Salman belong in? So the Prophet so the Muhajirun and the Ansar, the immigrants to Medina, and the locals of Medina, they started arguing with each other. And the Muhajirun were saying, Salmanu minna al-Muhajirun. Salman will be, is from amongst us, Muhajirun. Why? Because he wasn't born in Medina. He emigrated to Medina looking for Islam. The Ansar said, Salmanu minna al-Ansar. Salman is from amongst us, the Ansar. Because he came to Medina before the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, so he was already here when the Prophet ﷺ came, so he technically qualifies as an Ansari. Look at that, subhanAllah. They're fighting that no Salman's with us, they're saying no Salman's with us. Today we would have the opposite fight. You take the foreigner, you take the foreigner. But they're fighting, no, he's with us. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum had a lot of etiquette when dealing with the Prophet ﷺ. They wouldn't bring small little petty matters before the Prophet ﷺ because they were taught some etiquette. But this matter became so severe between them that they eventually had to bring the matter before the Prophet ﷺ. And they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Salman should be with us, the Muhajirun. They said, no, Salman should be with us, the Ansar. The Prophet ﷺ's decision was that Salman minna al al-bayt. Salman will not dig with the Muhajirun, Salman will not dig with the Ansar, Salman will dig with my family because he belongs to my family. That's the attitude the Prophet ﷺ taught us. And a couple of very interesting things that I came across in the seerah. You know, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, it says in the Qur'an, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That he is the ultimate role model, the most ex excellent example. And the Prophet ﷺ's own life was a manifestation of this type of a philosophy and this way of life. There are two of the women who nursed the Prophet ﷺ, meaning they breastfed the Prophet ﷺ. They were his foster mothers, wet nurse. Two of the mother, two of the women, from whom the Prophet ﷺ drank milk as an infant, as a baby, two of them were African, were black. One was Thuwaiba, um, and she was a slave girl who belonged to Abu Lahab, and she had nursed the Prophet ﷺ shortly after his birth. And the second woman was Baraka, also known as Ummu Ayman, 
And she was not just a woman who nursed the Prophet ﷺ, but she was a constant presence in his life. She was kind of like a surrogate mother to the Prophet ﷺ, so much so that he would often refer to her as, Oh Mother. And he would often say about her, he would say that she's the only thing I have left from my family. And he loved her very, very dearly. And she was very near and dear to his heart. And she was a black African woman. And she was known as one of the mothers of the Prophet ﷺ. Think about that for a second. Let that sink in. The Mu'addin of the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he traveled, wherever he was going to lead the prayer, the man that would call the Adhan, whether in Medina or abroad, the person that would call the Adhan before the Prophet ﷺ led the prayer, was, an, was a man by the name of Bilal, who was an African. He was a black African in a land of Arabs. So the Prophet of Allah ﷺ lived this reality. And we have to also learn to try to live this reality. Don't let these things be barriers between you and other people. We need to cut out of our culture and our habits the use of derogatory terms towards other people. A lot of times it's just, we might brush it off as being just, just, just playing around. We're just playing around, we're just joking. Brother, have a sense of humor. But you have to understand, it's not whether you find it funny or not. You have to look at it from the other person's perspective. Do they appreciate being talked about like this or not? Whether it's, a, whether it's a remark about their color, the color of their skin, or a remark about their culture, or their language, or whatever it is, don't speak about people like that. Because it shows that we still harbor these types of uh, attitudes. The Prophet of Allah one time heard somebody say something racist towards another person. And the Prophet said, Inna ka rajulun Fika jahiliya, that you are a man, in you is ignorance. Meaning you, you still behave ignorantly, you have ignorance within you. Let's try to remove the ignorance from us and enlighten ourselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to implement the guidance of the Qur'an and the beautiful teachings and example from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Quran Weekly. Alhamdulillah, if you just benefited from this video, the best thing you can do is share it with somebody else. You know, the Quran tells us about a responsibility we have. The Prophet ﷺ has also taught us about this responsibility. It's called Al-Amru bil Ma'roof wa Nahiyu an al Munkar. To enjoin the, enjoin the good and to prevent or to forbid that which is wrong or that which is bad. Well, what's one way we can do that is even sharing beneficial information like this because many of these videos talk about what we should do and some of these videos uh, remind us about things we shouldn't do. So inshallah, like the video, share it on Facebook, post it on, uh, tweet it out, share it with others inshallah and um, you know, spread the khair inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan.